Hello, and welcome to the Center on Transition Innovations Transition Tips. We're so excited to speak to you today concerning enhancing employment skills at home for students with significant disabilities. I'm Kendall St. John with the Center on Transition Innovations, and we're going to start today looking at the connection between home, school, and future work, and then move into some school routines that might help build employment skills at home. Hi, everyone. My name is Alyssa Brooke. I am the Director of Employment Research Training at VCU's Rehabilitation Research and Training Center. For the last 12 years, I have worked with students with significant disabilities who are transitioning from school to the adult world of work and have supported them in learning job skills, then getting a job, and most importantly, keeping that job. So today, I am going to share some common areas that we've provided support in the workplace and share ideas with you for how you can use supports to practice these skills at home as well. Students start developing work skills at home years before they start working in the community. Learning those early skills starts with our understanding that people work. Um, that initial understanding that people around us, our parents, grandparents, neighbors, friends, work in different jobs in the community is that beginning of career awareness. When they're young, they might understand that people work so that they can get cheddar bunnies or a toy from the store. As students grow, they expand that understanding of why we work and that they can contribute as part of their role in the family. Self-care tasks are some of those earliest contributions that students learn. Social interactions are another set of skills first learned in the home because they have to know how to interact. How can they interact with siblings, parents, and extended family? And that helps them learn those early work readiness skills as well. These skills grow over years of helping with tasks in the home and eventually taking on independent tasks and chores that they do. In addition to building early work skills, these tasks also demonstrate the ability to be a contributor in the home, um, how they can do for others. Children start by helping others in the home by stirring cake batter, um, providing dinner and water for the, the pets, or picking up their dirty clothes. Those are all really early work skills. These gradually morph into more independent chores as skills develop. The timeline might be extended for students with more significant support needs, but the process is the same. We start with those small skills and gradually work up to mastery. Our focus today will be on identifying the employment skills that students can learn and develop in the home during summer breaks, weekends, vacation times, or an extended stay-at-home order. As children, our first experiences with peers and supervisors other than our parents is at school. School is certainly where we learn academic skills, but this is also where we learn many, many work readiness skills and prepare for the eventual world of work. In Virginia, uh, we use the work readiness skills for the Commonwealth to address those qualities that employers want from their employees. These work readiness skills are used in every career and technical education course in Virginia, um, but they're also really great for being uh, used to assess early work skills that students can practice at school and at home. In the slide, you'll see on the left, a list of a few of the 22 work readiness skills for the Commonwealth. And on the right are a list of a few of the school expectations that align with those work readiness skills. Um, for example, when students follow a schedule, they're engaging in the efficiency and productivity work readiness skill. Other examples include certainly task completion, getting your work done and taking directions from others that lines up with the work ethic, work readiness skill, or asking for help. Alyssa is going to touch on that more in a little bit, um, is an important listening and speaking skill. Um, we also know, though, that making healthy choices and understanding healthy choices and following safety rules is all part of workplace safety. And attending to hygiene is an important professional um, skill that students need to know. In that same vein, some of us need extra supports in school and also at work. Let's go back to efficiency and productivity. Some of us need extra supports to follow a schedule. I know that right now I have an incredibly elaborate system to help me keep a schedule and keep on task during the time when I'm working at home. 
By the same token, some students need um, visual schedules or use their phone or smartwatch to help them keep on schedule. Knowing the types of supports that are needed and practicing in that home and at school are, and across all settings is wonderful information as students transition to work settings. Knowing the work readiness skills, practicing them at home and school, and recognizing the support needs a student will require to successfully engage in the workplace are great steps to building work skills and independence. So how do we pull home, school, and work and community together? Let's start by what works for your student at school. What are those supports at school that might help teach employment skills at home? The IEP is a great place to start, but you'll wanna flesh out some of the details. Working with your student's case manager to determine some tasks is a great place to start. But where within the IEP are you going to start looking? Um, accommodations and supports are a great place to, to start. Um, what works for your child to be successful during the school day? They may have accommodations related to academics, social supports, choice making, or any range of activities. Um, for example, maybe they respond really well to social stories or social scripts. Knowing this might help to teach them skills to interact on electronic platforms such as Zoom or FaceTime at home. Maybe you're having conversations with uh, extended family that don't live near, or your child wants to spend some time talking with a friend at school that they're not able to see. Um, those are great platforms, but sometimes they need a little bit of support to know exactly how to interact. This will help with social interactions now, but also with electronic work interactions in the future if they have to respond to a supervisor or an employer using one of those platforms or a similar one. Visual schedules or choice boards are another support that work very well at home to promote independence life skills and employment skills. Alyssa will go into more depth later on discussing how they might be used at home. Also those work-based instruction. Certainly, oh my goodness, if they're doing any sort of work at school, um, if there's a way to be able to replicate that or have a similar activity when they're at home, that just in, in reinforces that work-based instruction. How are they at service in their school community and how can they continue that at home? For example, maybe they're responsible for turning on computers in a computer lab at school or in their classroom. Um, what could they do at home to be able to replicate something similar? Um, I don't think very many of us have computer labs at home, but we all have many devices, um, multiple smartphones probably, um, iPads, tablets, other devices that need charging. Maybe your child or your student could be in charge of making sure that devices are charged, that they don't go below 25% that continuing that work-based instruction at home allows for continuity while also providing feedback on how well did they transfer job skills between settings. Uh, functional life skills in the IEP, um, those are ideal for looking at how can we replicate those at home. This could include self-care activities or skills around meal preparation, um, clothing care, household management, budgeting and shopping. I really love the example of a student I was working with who was washing dishes at school. And when the parent found that out, they were very eager to have the, the student replicate that in the home. Um, and they found out that uh, the tool that helped the student to be able to do that independently at school was just one of the sponge wands that has the soap in the, in the handle. Um, so the student never had to put their hand down into the water. Um, they could rinse the dishes and then wash them with that wand. Parent was thrilled to know that they had a dishwasher at home. <laughs> Implementing school supports, work tasks, and independent living skills in the home will help build future employment skills to mastery. Work with your child's case manager to determine employment skills to work on in the home. So as Kendall mentioned, every one of us uses supports to help us stay organized throughout the day. Think about how you wake up in the morning. I'm going to venture to say that the large majority of us use an alarm or some sort of a cue to wake up. As far as staying on track throughout the day, I personally could not survive without my cell phone alarms and written to-do lists, where other people prefer to organize everything that they have in an electronic calendar 
or maybe by writing themselves post-it notes. Just as you and I utilize tools to help us accomplish our work and stay on task, we implement supports in the workplace that will help our students who are now employees with these areas as well. And each of the supports is going to be very individualized and tailored to what works for that person. Over the next several slides, we're going to share some tools that have been used with interns and employees in the workplace. And again, you will see that there are a couple of different examples, so you can have an idea of maybe how you would want to tailor them when using them at home to work for your, um, your student at home. And our hope is that by implementing some of these skills, you will be able to, or some of these supports, you will able, be able to practice these work readiness skills at home. Developing these skills at home and finding the supports that work can take time. So the more that we practice with them in a safe environment, such as the home and such as the school, the more useful they will become for our students as they transition into the adult world of work. Making choices is an area which can be very difficult for some of the employees that I have supported. In many cases, employment is the most independence that someone has had without a parent, caregiver, or teacher right there with him, perhaps intentionally or maybe even unknowingly guiding them to make a good choice. Often work is the first time that they have the opportunity and responsibility to make choices of their own. So these choices um, can be anywhere from deciding what reinforcement to work for, what task to do first and how to prioritize, how to stock a closet properly, or even what to eat at lunchtime. To reduce the anxiety that comes from this challenge of decision-making, we develop supports to assist and often find that we create a structure um, for seemingly unstructured things. So while we do implement supports to develop routine and reduce the choice-making required, being able to make decisions is an important life skill. And we want to encourage families to consciously practice this skill at home. As a parent, I know that making the decision for my son can be easier for all of us sometimes, but in order to foster this skill of him learning how to choose, I provide him with two viable options for him to choose between. I'll admit sometimes it can be more time consuming, but it gives him control, it gives him buy-in to our decisions, and it's necessary for him to learn how to choose and make decisions, and for me as the parent to nurture this choice-making skill in a safe place, because this skill can sometimes be um, anxiety-producing, overwhelming, and even frustrating. So Kendall had mentioned the use of choice boards, and I'm just going to share here two examples of choice boards which have been used at the work site. The first one on the left there, um, the horizontal one, it is, you have a number of um, tasks that are, are listed on each of those small cards. And the individual needs to complete all of these tasks in their shift, but is able to, to determine what order they want to choose to work in. Um, so that is before initiating the task, you sit together as the job coach, you work with the uh, employee to determine what order are you going to work in. And then we don't deter from that once, once it's set up. Um, the one on the right, you see a cup of ice, a Snickers bar, a puzzle, and a uh, two people having a conversation. So sometimes getting a paycheck is not a frequent enough reinforcement for us. Um, for our students and new employees, and we need to create a support with more frequent opportunities to earn a reward. So for this particular individual, we worked with her beforehand to say, what would you be motivated to choose from? Um, honestly, most often she chose to get a cup of crushed ice, um, to be working for a cup of crushed ice, but Similarly, before her shift, we would say, what are you working for? And she would take this piece, which was Velcroed and just Velcroed onto her um, support at the top of her visual schedule. So she knew that that's what she was working for that day during that shift. Something like a choice board can certainly be used at home as well. Um, the example that we have here is a choice board for outside choices. What are you going to do when you get outside? And so those squares, the little ones that are around the larger square there, those are examples, those are your choices, and you would work with your 
um, child at home beforehand to say, what are we going to do when we go outside and make that selection? And um, that means that they're really getting the buy-in for what they're going to be doing with that day. I think so much of the supports that we create is really helping our students, and in my case, new employees, really feel like this is their job, you know, giving them ownership over the choices that they get to make. Okay. One of the work readiness skills which Kendall spoke about is efficiency and productivity. And she mentioned that in the school that this looks like following a schedule. Well, in the workplace, we have schedules too, and we have responsibilities, but sometimes we have a set of list of responsibilities and we need to prioritize on our own when they should occur. This can be very difficult. Oftentimes, I find the people that I work with may um, continue to complete the tasks that they prefer over and over again, and so then the unpreferred tasks may not get completed. Or if somebody has um, to do something that gets repeated more than one time in a day, they may feel like, well, I already checked the faxes, I don't need to do it again. But certainly you do because faxes can be coming in throughout the day. So um, in these situations, we would help to create a schedule, a written schedule for somebody to follow. So this example um, is of a written schedule that we used in a workplace. And we worked with the employer to determine what the high priority tasks were. So we broke it down into the morning schedule of high priority tasks and the afternoon schedule of high priority tasks. We then um, got, after having that information from the employer, we met with the employee and said, what are your preferred tasks? So that way we were inter able to intersperse them throughout the day so that he wasn't just bogged down with, oh, these things, these are the things that I really don't like to do. I have to do them all in a row. Um, and so getting him involved in this, it empowered him and helped him to stay motivated and engaged in the schedule uh, once it was implemented. So something like this, just like this can be done at home. And as you'll see there, there's a list of secondary tasks. So once you get these priorities completed, then we move on to these other things. You can do something just like this in the home environment, um, having a written schedule. Maybe many of you are already doing this. So of course, it's going to be modified to suit the needs of your child and of your household. But a simple list of just what should I be doing during the day? It's, it's really easy, especially in this situation with the stay-at-home order that we're in right now, to get out of a routine. Um, I know personally, you know, if I don't wake up in the morning and take a shower and get dressed as if I'm going to work, I'm not going to be as productive. So it's important for me to follow that routine that I would typically follow when I'm leaving the house to go to work. And you may be finding that at home as well, that because we have the opportunity right now to be a bit more lax, that maybe we're not getting as much done. So it would be a great time to implement following a daily schedule and needing to follow that routine. I would really encourage you to get your son or daughter, your child involved in the creation of this list. Just the way that we got the employee to say, hey, what do you like to do at work? You would want to ask your son or daughter, hey, what do you like to do when you're at home? And then have them customize the list. I mean, it can be fun. Um, you know, have them pick their favorite colors to use, to decorate it, build how they want their schedule to be, and then certainly to come up with the list of fun things to do when their chores are finished. So here's an example of a visual schedule, which has been used at work. This is... Um, this was created for somebody who actually does not read. However, her preference was to have the words there listed. So in addition to the picture, she wanted the words. So certainly we put that on there for her. This is a bit more of a mini schedule. This person works in a hotel and has a number of responsibilities. Cleaning the lobby is one of those things. So this is a visual with the steps of how to clean the lobby. And I will tell you that initially this was not broken down enough. So we even had to break out some more of those tasks. Specifically, we broke down the steps in a visual of how to take out the trash, how to vacuum in a system so that you're, you're vacuuming the entire carpet. 
So you can really, with a visual schedule, just as a written, break it out into as much detail as absolutely necessary for your um, student to be successful. And just as you would use that type of a support in the workplace, you can use it at home. So on here, uh, the example that we have, they're written the words living room, bedroom, bathroom. In order to turn that into a visual, take a picture with your cell phone um, and just put the picture on there. It's really, really quite simple. And so many of these supports that we use, we do end up laminating them and just posting them up on a wall um, so that you can check it off, wipe it clean, and then repeat it the next day. But you can absolutely also put it on a cell phone um, or on a tablet if that's the, a, a better method to get your son or daughter engaged. Okay, here is another visual support, which the same employee who worked in the hotel used. This was an example for her of how to clean the fitness room. And the only thing that I really wanted to show you on here is that we included pictures. So if you look at machines, it tells her, um, it's a picture of what cleaning supply to use, as well as the mirror. Um, it's a picture of what towel to use. So you can build that into it, not just a picture of this is the task, but oh, this is also the supply I will need in order to get this done. Alyssa? Yep. I, I've also worked with um, some students who have had a lot of success with um, their schedule or their task on Google Slides that they can just um, sort of maneuver through. And it's a picture of them doing the actual task so that they can see what they need to do. Um, I yeah. just want to add that in because I thought it was, I thought it was genius when I saw them doing that. <laughs> Yeah, that is, a, that is a really great idea. And I think that your point of having um, the person, maybe the picture of themselves is a really good consideration. I always give the person that I'm working with the choice. Do you want it to be a real picture? Do you want it to be, you know, a clip art type of picture? Do you want to be in it? And so that they're getting that choice in, in um, what the picture actually looks like so that it's something that's meaningful to them. So thanks, Kendall, for sharing that. Um, a visual support can be used to teach any skill. So in the workplace, you may need to break out, I mean, in the home, I'm sorry, um, you may need to break out the steps a little bit more and you can do that with a visual. So from anything, you really can do it with anything from how to make a sandwich, uh, how to use the microwave, how to clean the bathroom, how to turn on Netflix. So the point just is that Anything that you could put into written form that has a step-by-step -step instructions, you can totally do it with pictures as well. And you should feel comfortable to make it as detailed as it needs to be for um, the person you're supporting to be independent. Okay. In this example, we worked with someone who was required to stock several closets in a large business. And the same materials went into each closet, but different numbers of those materials went into each closet. This person was somebody who did not do very well with numbers, and so counting wasn't really a strength of his. Um, and because the closets weren't uniform, it made it even more difficult. But the best solution that we came up with was to provide him with a completed picture of what a properly stocked closet looks like. We took a separate picture of each of the closets, again, laminated it, hung it inside the closet. When he was learning, he was able to refer to it. And then it's, it's still up there, even though actually he was an intern, so he's not even there anymore. But the picture is still up there and it supports anybody who's going to stock the closet in knowing exactly what it should look like to be properly stocked. Um, in the home, you could do something very similar to this. You could teach your child how to put their clothes away neatly, how to stock the pantry, how to put away their books, anything, absolutely anything you can teach them and just show them this is a completed version of it. This is what it should look like when you're done. But not only would we be working on the work skill of productivity and task completion with this, but we would also be working on following directions. So if you're using this at home, I would really encourage you to check in once the work is completed. If the closet does not match the way that it looks in the picture, 
provide constructive feedback until it meets the quality standards that have been set in the picture. So not only would this be working on that task completion and quality, but you'll also be addressing a really important skill of taking direction. And we are going to talk a bit about soft skills as well, but any time that you can couple them together in the home, I think it's really, really going to be valuable for um, that transition to work. So as Kendall discussed earlier, one of the work readiness skills is making healthy choices and understanding the difference between healthy and unhealthy choices. So I just want to share that um, there have been many, many instances that I've worked with people who have not had so much freedom before in choosing what they're going to eat and have often had somebody with them if they're in the school cafeteria or out at a restaurant helping them to decide what they're going to have. So when you're at work by yourself and perhaps you're in a cafeteria or out at a restaurant, it's like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I have so many things to choose from. I can't tell you how many times we've really had to work with people to understand that two hamburgers, a slice of pizza, an ice cream and cookies is not a balanced meal. So um, I would encourage you to help your child begin understanding how to balance a meal by including them in meal planning and preparation. Dinner's a lot to tackle most of the time, so I'd recommend starting with breakfast or lunch. Again, I would provide them with a few good choices and then allow them to choose from um, each category and put their own meal together. So for this particular individual, this is a support that we used in the workplace, and this person was really excited to be in, um, in a cafeteria with a, just a huge array of choices. And food is a very personal thing. So when we tried to correct him in the workplace, it actually really resulted in a pretty significant outburst that was unprofessional um, in the cafeteria setting because we were trying to tell him what he could and couldn't eat. And that, like I said, is a really personal decision. So what we decided to do was we spoke with his parents um, and with him to just say, what, what do you want his meal to look like, how much should he be spending as well? So prior to going to lunch, uh, we would review this list. It was a pocket card that could fit in his um, uniform. And he would decide one of each of those things that he was going to have, whether it's chicken fingers, pizza, hot dog, or a hamburger. Is he going to have a side of fries that day or cheese sticks, um, etc. You'll also notice that it breaks out how to build a salad. So this person was getting a salad, but his salad consisted of a bowl of pepperonis, um, cheddar cheese, and doused in ranch dressing. And so we taught him how to build a salad. And the family really practiced this with him at home as well, um, how to build a salad. So this is just another example, which you may not have thought of before, but choosing what's an appropriate meal and um, how to manage that independently is a really, really important work skill to have. Okay, let's talk about hygiene. And uh, this is always a bit of a touchy subject, but it is, it's really, really important. And so we would be not doing our job if we didn't touch on this today. Um, first of all, now more than ever, we are talking about the importance of practicing hand hygiene. And we know that keeping our hands clean can keep us and our coworkers, our families, and the public we inter interact with safe. Uh, secondly, most employers have guidelines for grooming. They often address these in orientation, uh, where they cover a lot of other material, so it's probably not really retained at that time. But having good hygiene and being well-kempt really makes a strong impression on those that you are around. So many of you have probably worked with somebody who has an unpleasant odor and are likely, you know, cr kind of crinkling your nose at that memory. memory. And surely you don't want your family member to be that person. Um, you also don't want others in the workplace commenting on your child's greasy hair or dirty fingernails, things like that. So we have made many hygiene lists and sent them home. Um, I'm going to show you a number of them today because this is absolutely something that you all can be working on, especially during this time when we're spending so much 
time at home. Um, again, we, we laminate these lists and we encourage family members and the employees to hang it up in the bathroom and to make sure that, you know, it becomes a checklist. So uh, this particular example, we worked with somebody who did have a pretty strong odor, very greasy hair. Really, it was obvious he really wasn't washing and showering on a daily basis. And so we worked with him to just say, what do we need to do every day to have good hygiene? <laughs> and we built this list. We sent the list home. They hung it up in their bathroom. And then when he would come in each day, the following day, we would review with him, did these things get done? I will say that it really worked well. Um, we got really good feedback from the family as well that this was the first time that they had a response um, from him and a commitment from him to practice these good hygiene skills. So the level of detail in each of these photos will, deter will, will be determined by how much support your family member needs in, um, in practicing good hygiene. Here's a more detailed list, for example. Um, this one's also with somebody who didn't feel comfortable having it be real people pictures, so it's more of a cartoon animation, um, cartoony look for pictures. But it also broke down the steps specifically for how to take a bath. And, you know, all the way from turning on the water to washing your feet. So it, it, it's just a more detailed list. This example here is a much less detailed list. Uh, again, it's with visuals and coupled with words. This person knew how to do all of the steps in, in his hygiene routine, but wasn't doing them, uh, wasn't doing them on a, on a consistent basis. And so we worked with him just to say, how do I get ready for work? All the way from waking up to brushing your teeth. And just, it was a checkpoint of, um, how to make my, I have to make my bed. I have to use the bathroom. I have to take a bath, et cetera. Um, until from the period of waking up to getting out the door to catch your ride, to go to work. This person did not want pictures on his list. And, um, again, knew the steps, knew how to complete each of those steps, but needed support with the frequency because, you know, Cleaning under fingernails wasn't happening. Brushing teeth wasn't happening on a daily basis. So we worked with him to say, and his family again, to just determine the under and help him learn and understand the frequency which our hygiene routines should occur. So those are pretty detailed lists. And oftentimes, you know, the detailed list when it comes to hygiene is what we'll send home. But we do some small mirror checks at work as well, just to make sure that during the day, you're still keeping up that professional appearance. So here's an example, which we used with a girl when she got to work, this hung in her locker. So when she got to work, she did a mirror check. Um, is my hair professional? Is my face clean? I don't have any breakfast on it. And are my scrubs clean? And she would do the same mirror check um, upon arrival to work and then after her lunchtime. And this is an example, um, which we also used in the workplace. It gave a cue to the person to look in the mirror and then check off is my, is my face clean? Are my nails clean? And is my uniform clean? So as you can tell, this was really tailored um, specifically to the areas that this person needed to work on um, to practice good hygiene in the workplace. So when we talk about work readiness skills, we are really not just talking about the hard skills that are required to complete each of the job tasks. The soft skills that we need to employ on the job can actually be even more important than those hard skills. In my experience, if someone is having trouble completing a task, but they ask for help, they're professional, um, they're polite, then their supervisor will be understanding of the learning curve and accommodations that are needed to help support this person. However, if someone is unprofessional, unwilling to take instruction, uh, disruptive, does not respond when spoken to, then this is often more of a problem for the employer. So being unable to fit into the workplace culture is a more common reason from my experience for termination than not being able to do a task. 
Uh, for this reason, we really want to practice social skills in school and in the home. Some of the most important skills that I've seen over the years are asking for help, accepting feedback, and having reciprocal conversation. And I really just want to note that we've worked with a number of people who um, are nonverbal or, you know, communication is really, really quite a challenge. And that doesn't mean <laughs> that they can't have conversation and it doesn't mean that they can't respond to their employer. So no matter what somebody's communication style is, we need to learn it and then we need to teach it to the employer. Um, it's really the job coach's responsibility to say, hey, it's not verbal communication, but this is how you can interact best with this individual. And so any information that family members and schools can support in regards to the best ways to communicate is really, really good information. So the reason we included a photo of people playing a board game here is because this is a great way for you to practice these social skills at home. Um, playing board games, it's fun. So there's that. Um, but it also, if you think about it, requires us to take turns, to follow directions, to listen to others, to ask for help if needed, to respond to cues, and handle our frustration if we're losing, or to win with grace. So here's a sample for how to ask for help. Um, once again, I know that it is easy to become lax in the home. Um, I'd really encourage you though, to give your children the opportunity, or your young adults to um, have the opportunity to ask for help before you jump in and assist them. I know as the parent or the caregiver or the teacher, you can likely assume what is needed um, just based on your observations and just knowing the person but I'd like you to take a pause and require that your uh, student ask for help before you insert yourself and eliminate that opportunity for them to practice how to ask for help because this is a skill in the workplace that is so critical. The sample that we have on here, it, it's pretty detailed, honestly, um, and it breaks down the steps for asking for help at work. And again, this is going to be really, really tailored to whatever type of job and the work environment it is. Uh, for this person, we coupled it uh, like an icon with the sentence describing what to do. It's not always going to be this detailed. In the workplace, just as we break down the steps for how to complete a job, we can break down the steps for any social skills. So that asking for help one, that was kind of a, a longer to-do list if you want to ask for help. Um, but we can make it something much more brief that looks like this. So how to act, accept correction, correction, excuse me. So how to accept correction will look very different depending on the person and the environment. Um, once again, it's tailored to their individual needs in their environment. So the first example that you have there on the left, it's a generic list of steps for how to follow instructions. I look at the person, say, okay, repeat back the instructions and then check back. Did I do it right? That level of detail may be enough for somebody. It might not be enough for somebody else. We may need it to say, I look at the person, I close my mouth, I listen, I say, okay. So you see there, you would build in the different um, prompts depending on what each person needs. So the second example on the right-hand side, if I get frustrated at work, this was really tailored to a particular person who would get very visibly frustrated at work if he had to wait or if his schedule changed or if he was corrected. Um, this in the workplace, this looked like hysterics, um, tears, runny nose, throwing himself to the floor, running, tripping sometimes, not paying attention to his own surroundings. So it became a safety issue for others as well. So we coupled a little bit of a social story. Sometimes at work, I have to wait or my schedule changes or my boss corrects me. This might make me feel frustrated. If I do feel frustrated, I can. So stop, take a cleansing breath through my nose and out of my mouth. And we practice how to do this so that they don't end up hyperventilating. Um, squeeze the hacky sack because he always had a hacky sack and say Hakuna Matata and go back to work. So the Hakuna Matata, this is somebody who loved the Lion King. And when we talked to his mom about the challenges that we were having in the workplace, she said, 
We use Hakuna Matata. It means no worries. And we say that at home. So we took what they use at home and that's successful. And we put that into the workplace support as well. And one thing that I'd like to say about this is these supports, um, these two in particular, were made to be on pocket cards so they could fit on a ring. Or you could even have a picture of it on somebody's um, cell phone. And we practice how to how to um, complete these skills when the person's not feeling frustrated and not having trouble following instructions. So we would do a daily check-in to say, a, a check in more than one time in a shift actually to say, what do I do? What do you do if you get frustrated at work and have him use his reference card? So then if he actually did get frustrated at work, we would say, well, what do you do when you get frustrated at work and direct him to use his reference card? Having that practice would help him to feel a little bit more comfortable with it. So in the home, I'd really love for um, you all to sort of develop these coping plans and then be prepared to share them with their support teams when they return to school and enter into the workforce. Thanks, Alyssa. I, I, I really love all that you shared and all of those resources for, for families to be able to use at home. Certainly check out the resources um, related to creating schedules, task lists and choice boards. Um, thank you for joining us today. I hope you're able to take away some new ideas for enhancing work skills and employment skills at home. For additional transition information and resources, visit CTI's website, sign up for our weekly news blast. And if you haven't done so already, please like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and thank you again for joining CTI's transition tips. Thank you.